Hi all, I'm Claire Kovacs. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions at the Binghamton University Art Museum. And I want to welcome you all to this digital space to share a conversation between Michal Hyman and John Tagg around the exhibition, Michal Hyman, Chronically Linked. I will introduce both of them in a moment, but I wanted to take a quick moment to share some thanks. First and foremost, I wanna thank Michal for her generosity in lending her work and sharing her wisdom, energy, and digital space with me as we plan this exhibition. Thanks too to John Tagg for having the seed of this idea for the exhibition and bringing that seed back here to Binghamton University. Thanks to the staff at Jewish American University and the Katzen Center for, at American University for their help in stewarding these works through the pandemic. To Elizabeth Mosier for thinking with John and I about programming possibilities and more on that in a moment. Thanks to Artists Contemporary Art Organization and especially Harris and Debbie Tilbitz for their generous support of the exhibition and programming. Finally, I wanna thank my colleagues here at Binghamton who helped along uh, on this long and meandering road to, to making this exhibition and programming possible. For those of you who are local, I'd like to invite you to, to an in-gallery event, Elizabeth Mosier, the Asylum Project Selections and Linkages that will be happening on Tuesday, November 15th at 6 p.m. in the main gallery. There will be reserved seating and I will drop that link in the chat right now. One in the meeting. Hang on one second. There we go. We also have one more Zoom conversation coming up in November. This time, Mikhail will be in conversation with Elizabeth Mosier, Binghamton University Associate Professor of Theater, about the linkages between Hyman and Mosier's, Mosier's work. This will take place on Wednesday, November 30th, from noon to 1 p.m., 7 to 8 p.m. Israel time. <clears throat> Again, there will be pre-registration and it will be recorded. So I'm gonna drop the link for that in the chat as well. A few housekeeping rules before I introduce our speakers today. The conversation is being recorded and will be available via the museum's webpage or YouTube page and webpage soon. Please keep <laughs> yourselves muted during uh, Michal and John's conversation, but feel free to share questions and comments in the chat. We'll have time at the end for a moderated discussion. So at that time, please signal in the chat that you would like to speak. If you do it any earlier, I might miss it. You can eat, you can also use the raise hand icon and I will moderate the conversation with questions in the order that folks sign up. For those of you unfamiliar with Zoom, the chat and raise hand icon are located on the Zoom toolbar, which is likely at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, click the three dots and that provides access to additional tools. So now let me get to some quick introductions and I'll get out of myself out of the way and back behind the digital curtain. Michal Hyman is a Tel Aviv based artist, curator, member of the Tel Aviv Institute for Contemporary Psychoanalysis, a theorist and activist whose work inhabits the spaces between art and therapy, photography and diagnosis, theory and praxis. As installations, video, sound, photography, performance and archival displays, her work has been shown in venues such as the University of Melbourne Museum of Art, Documenta 10, Le Cartier, which is in Kimper, the Jewish Museum in New York, the Museum of Modern Art at Satima City, the Van Abbey Museum in Eindhoven, the Museum Ludwig in Cologne, and the American University Museum in DC, as well as the American Jewish University in Los Angeles. Hyman is the founder and director of the International Public Benefit Corporation, an academy of her own, which was founded in 2018, which advocates for gender equality, the eradication of sexual violence, mistreatment, and other forms of oppression, mainly in academic institutions and the field of arts and visual cultures. John Tagg is the SUNY Distinguished Professor and Bartle Professor of Art History at Binghamton University and looks at forms of photographic practice that were not previously part of the history of photography and writes about photography not as a self-contained medium, but as a complex apparatus whose social effects and effects of meaning are multiple and diverse. His interests extend to the ways in which we construct histories of cultural technologies and visual regimes and the range of theoretical debates that since the 1970s have transformed the business of art history. His publications have been translated into more than 15 languages and include the burden of representation, essays on the photographies and histories, Grounds of Dispute, Art History, Cultural Politics in the Discursive Field, and the Disciplinary Frame, Photographic Truth, and the Capture of Meaning. Join me in welcoming both of them. Thank you, Claire. Um, and perhaps 
I can make a start. Uh, hello and welcome to everybody. It's um, we've now established that it's uh, it's 12 noon in Ithaca, where I am, and in Binghamton, New York, and it's actually seven o'clock rather than eight o'clock in the evening in Tel Aviv. So I am most grateful to be joined at such an hour by Michael Hyman for this museum conversation <clears throat> and the. <clears throat> The context for our conversation is, of course, Michal Hyman chronically linked. Michal's uh, exhibition at the Binghamton University Art Museum, uh, the largest presentation, I believe, of Michal's work to date in the United States. Uh, I think that's true, um, right. which is testimony to the amazing cooperation between Michal and Claire and the University Art Museum. And indeed, here I must pause to give a shout out to the curator of the exhibition, Claire Kovacs, who has done a truly remarkable job of bringing together work in so many diverse formats, platforms and media, then using the full space of the museum so effectively to make visible the coherence of Michal's unfolding project and yet at the same time to articulate its many faceted uh, components. So where are we to begin with this dense and challenging array of work? Well, perhaps we can begin in Springfield Park, in Tooting, in South London, where in fact, at one time I used to live, and where in 1848, the doctor and psychiatrist Hugh Welsh Diamond arrived to succeed Sir Alexander Morrison as resident superintendent of the Surrey County Pauper Lunatic Asylum. And it was here in Springfield Park that Diamond um, a keen and technically accomplished amateur photographer and indeed a founding member of the Photographic Society in 1853. It was here in uh, Springfield Park that um, Diamond conceived his plan to update his predecessor's atlas of engraved portraits of inmates by making photographs of the patients, especially those in the female ward, perhaps because um, insanity was thought at the time to be a predominantly female affliction, even though the majority of asylum inmates were actually men. Now, the photographs that Diamond made were intended perhaps in the first place to supplement the written records, which were required by the Lunacy Act of 1845. But Diamond also believed that these photographs could function as diagnostic and even therapeutic tools, um, furnishing psychiatry with a more faithful physiognomic map of the varieties of mental illness a map that Diamond believed would connect the visible, the physiognomy of the inmate, to the invisible, the mental state. Now, what that means is that haunting portraits as they may be, Diamond's photographs have to be understood as an integral part of the institutional and medical apparatus within which alone they had their meaning and within which alone they produced their disciplinary effects. And yet what's striking about Michal's response to these photographs is that this is not what frames her encounter with Dr. Diamond's Surrey Asylum photographs and with one photograph in particular. So perhaps we can begin by asking Michal to try to describe the encounter that she had 
and to bring out for us where that encounter would lead. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the introduction and everything you said. And hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor. I'm so happy that I met John some years ago. It's already quite a long time. And since then, one of my dreams was to show my work with you and, of course, have a conversation with you. And you introduced me to Claire and everything you said, I agree. She's done such a great job um, in, a, in, in, in a, some two projects, big projects and other uh, videos and films that's so difficult to, to, to make them together. And thank you, Claire. Um, when you showed before um, the Institute, I felt my heart was beating here because I lived here, I was here for many years, and I will explain. In May 2017, in the course of my research, I encountered a photo in a book, and in the midst, it was in the midst of developing my new Hyman test, it's a, a test that we'll probably talk later, I ordered a book of historian Sander Gilman, The Face of Madness, and it was written there, Huge Diamond and the Origin of Psychiatric Photography, which was published in 1976. I didn't know uh, the name of Diamond. I never heard, although I, I know uh, the history of photography, but somehow never heard. And the book included lectures, case studies, and photographs, and engravings of patients, mainly women. Uh, and I had an encounter with a photograph of what you can, uh, what you can think it's an anonymous, anonymous woman that was taking circa 1855, who is wearing an asylum issue dress taken by Dr. Diamond. This British psychiatrist, it just told about him now, who was the resident medical superintendent of the female department of the Surrey Asylum in London from 1848 to 1858. And I have to say, I immediately recognized the younger version of myself. I even recognized my particular hands. I think we have the hands uh, later. So that was quite a shock. And I thought to myself, what can I do? I showed the photograph to my kids, to other people. And, you know, everyone has a photograph or sees people that you think, oh, they a little bit look like me. But this was something different. Now, I know this photograph was taken 150 years ago, I know. But when I look at the photograph, there's no doubt that it's me. So here, you, you understand, John? I mean, it's uh, uh, people saying this is me, they can be hospitalized uh, in an asylum because the people will tell them, no, it's not you. So I'm saying, I know it was taking 150 ago. We don't talk here about carnation or anything like that. But when I look at the photograph, there is no doubt it's me. So what I did, I decided on the spot that I'm going to sew myself the same dress because I saw in the book that many women, in the book, many photographs, the women were dressing the same, uh, the same dress. I went to a semester and I asked her to copy the dress. She found the fabric, she found it, it was blue. So she, as a matter of fact, she decided of the project color, the blue. And I decided that I want to go 
to the asylum. And as I believe that through photography and through videos and through art, one can infiltrate to other spaces. I do believe and most of my work is about that. Then I thought that if I'll make myself the dress and if I'll take my photo, then I might be able to return to myself in the 19th century. But for that, I needed to start and make a research of what it's like in the 19th century. And of course, in the 19th century, women has no rights, nor on their bodies, nor on the children, nor on the property, and not even the right of hearing. It's not that men had paradise in asylums, but at least they had the right of hearing. Women didn't have. So I thought to myself, how can I go on my own to the 19th century? And I started to build a community of women and other people. And I took about 150 photographs and videos of people with the same dress, with different tactics that I will tell later in order to come back to myself. And meanwhile, since the beginning, I understood that as a matter of fact, I'm also making a research about the right to return. What is my right to return to myself in the 19th century? How do I do that? And I started to investigate and think and try and through psychoanalysis, through regression, through smell, through, I'll, I'll tell later the list, to find out how do I do this. And I also thought that spaces of art like museums or galleries can help me to build fields of, uh, uh, of that really remind an asylum. I, I studied the, the, the way uh, asylums are built. And I also sat with the dress in exhibitions, asking people, I was with the dress, asking people to give me advice of how to get to the 19th century. And I had a lot of advices, especially from kids. So this is this photo. And I have to say, John, when I look at it, it's hard to explain. You know, I went to London. I, I took with me my daughter and one more person because I was, I was afraid I will faint if I see myself. I went to an uh, archive where they had the original and they let it out for some seconds because it's not allowed. But then I go to the NGA in Washington and they had had a copy. And the kind woman there, I told her the story, I told her it's me. And she let me be for 30 minutes alone, which is not allowed with myself and with the photograph uh, for 30 minutes. So this is my beginning. So you also go back to Springfield Park um, as if you are returning um, almost to what one might call the primal scene of the marriage of psychiatry and photography. Yes. What's striking is what you see there isn't what I see there, a disciplinary apparatus in which the images are part of that larger disciplinary machinery. You see yourself. Mm -hmm. there in the inmate's place. And you then uh, refuse to repeat her perpetual objectification and you literally don her institutional dress, a dress that then seems to become for, not just for you, but as we'll see for others too, a dress which almost becomes a mobile vehicle of mm -hmm both identification, but also difference. Um, and that issues in a striking uh, series of large scale color portraits. Um, and nine of them appear in the exhibition together with a, a further um, 24 images from the series, which are displayed as you see here in a, in a grid. Some of them 
single portraits, some of them double portraits, some of them holding masks uh, of figures that we recognize, masks that then extend the chain of identificatory cross-dressing yet further. So thinking about this striking series of portraits, uh, how did you arrive at your sitters, um, at your poses, and, and I should note, not all of the, not all of them involve um, only women. There are men too. So, how did you um, locate your sitters, set the poses? Uh, what was that process? Okay, so, um, so, so first, I'll say something about. Uh, I don't know. I can't say my, my work or myself because I can't really distinguish. Um, for many years, I think over 30 years, uh, I'm entering photographs, videos, sounds, and archival materials, which is very, very demanding. It's, require, it's requiring a lot of courage. And it started since I was first in the dark room, uh, doing art, whatever. I always um, separated myself from the camera. I didn't feel that photography for me is a camera. I always was for shared events uh, with the camera. And we're talking about in the starting in the beginning of the eighties. I always removed myself uh, from the position of the photographer. I always undermine the role of professional and art photographers. Uh, I always, uh, I, I was uh, naturalizing questions of authorship and I was focusing on issues other than the photographers. So for many years, I have interpreted this act as an objection to photography. I believe that uh, photography is, is double standard, fundamental to photography. And the question of photograph ownership and other question, as well as the act of photography itself, is always posed and are still posing an obstacle for me. So what I did instead of using photography, like, um, I mean, like even people now that's talking about photography in different ways, I don't know if how much people entered photography. So I entered photographs, videos, sounds, and I also inhabiting my body of another in photographs. I'm breathing their breaths and I'm trying to revive them. And it's all very dangerous. I'm finding an access to another time, a traumatic, a trauma, traumatic time women, children, persons with disabilities, protesters, minorities, and other vulnerable groups deprived of their human rights. And it's, I think it may be only possible through these actions, not just to talk about it. But it is costly, and my body is aware of this, and I will connect it later to find the plate 34 because uh, the image you showed of myself is uh, called plate 34 in the book of um, uh, Face of Madness. And so my mind, and I believe that every resurrection between two or more objects or subjects deter determined to become a radical linking. And the name of the exhibition chronically linked is partly because I know that uh, there is a sil an asylum, uh, Claire told me, and then Elizabeth, an asylum in Binghamton, and it was part of it was uh, for chronically drink, drunk people, right? So I called it chronically and linked because this is the name. And I believe that there, uh, it's radical linking, but I can believe also that all this linking can result in death or injury. And it's important for me to say that because when I took on myself to go back or I don't know if it's back, maybe it's not back, to play 34 to myself, I asked a lot of questions and it was a risk because um, I was quite sick for three years 
when I encountered this photograph. And while, while I didn't feel good, I also took these portraits. And everyone that came, I decided whom I'm taking with me. So I, think I, I took my family, I took friends, I took psychoanalysts, I took uh, uh, um, Palestinians, I took uh, dif from different uh, uh, religions people because I wanted to be able to meet the people in the asylums in the 19th century. The photographs that I took and the photographs in the book and uh, to be able to really, really build a community with all of us. So I took curators. I took, uh, this is Noraldine. Noraldine is a dear friend of mine now, he is in Canada, but he was an asylum seeker uh, in Israel, and he was for many for quite a long time uh, in a detention place without rights. Um, and I did to him. He took photographs there, and I did three ex solo exhibition with him. And I wish him much luck in Canada. And if you look at this photograph, when I I told the uh, Dean about my project, and I told him I don't know what to do. There is no in the in the book. There are no black people. And I'm afraid that the God, the keeper in the asylum in the 19th century, which I have a big dialogue with him, the keeper, the God will not let you in. He won't buy that you are with the same dress like the, the, the dress of uh, the women in the asylum. So look what Noraldin did for this project. As he knows what humiliation is, he took himself into the dress, like disappearing, like weakening himself. I have also a video with him so that the God will not be afraid of him and we let him into the asylum to be with our community. So with everyone that I was with, I told the story, I showed the book, I showed the gestures of the people in the book so that the God, is my my uh, my imagination God, but I don't like the word imagination. I never like the word imagination because you used to tell uh, children that uh, what they say just now it's imagination. So I always confused with this title imagination. But this God, uh, uh, the, uh, a lot happened with because of him because we had to trick him and to find we have I have uh, in this project three hundred different tactics to be able to travel, to travel to the 19th century. They're only in the book. So what you're bringing out, Mikhail, is, is, is that this is not just a portrait gallery. The very title of the original project, Radical Link, A New Community of Women, 1855 to 2020, that signals that um, you're more concerned with the relationship between these images and the way that they gather around you uh, a protective yes. uh, community and solidarity. But it also seems to me that that extends um, to the audience, to the viewers in the gallery, um, in that what matters is not, not these as a, a, as a gallery of portraits, what matters is what the, what the portraits do, what they, conjure into place and what they draw in uh, the spectator into in constructing what you call a kind of new community, a coming community, um, a performative community, yes. a community that is then, as you've brought out, unbound from relations of power and difference, mm -hmm. unbound from body and time, unbound from uh, gender and racial difference, all those things in which our identities are caught, performatively, this striking series of portraits seems to invite us to release ourselves from in order to join that community with you going back to the 19th century. You know, I'll tell you a story. When I showed the first time and I was with the dress in the space, a girl came in with her parents and grandparents because she was very young. And she sat in front of me and she said, I was here already. 
um, but I was here with my class and the boys didn't let us look at the exhibition. They were very cheeky. So I asked my parents uh, to bring me again. So I say to her, why? And she said, you know, they, they told that I'm, um, I don't know how you said it, like kind of genius and I'm in a special class at school and I feel so lonely and so bad. And when I entered the space here, I felt that there were no more any categories. Hmm. And that's what's so beautiful. So what, what's important here and what's important about so much of your work is its performative character. And, and I want to come back to that a little later in our conversation. Mm -hmm. But for now, I'd like to go back again to that moment of your overwhelming encounter with Diamond's photograph, which as you say, mm -hmm. becomes plate 34 of yeah. John Connolly's 1858 commentary on diamonds photographs. Yes. Now, it strikes me that psychoanalysis would say that this sudden and engulfing sense of recognition is itself symptomatic of some repressed yet insistently returning um, drive or desire. And it made me think here of Freud's commentary on Wilhelm Jensen's novel, Gradiva, mm -hmm. a novel in which the protagonist is suddenly and overwhelmingly gripped by his encounter in Rome with an antique relief. And I think yes. we can see that. An mm -hmm. antique relief of a walking woman yeah. in which it is the very angle of her trailing foot that fixates him that becomes the object of a compelling and increasingly obsessive pursuit that will lead him back to Pompeii and to the unraveling of all his careful strategies of memory management and forgetting. And indeed, as, as we can see next, uh, Freud himself had a cast of this relief um, hanging in his consulting room in Vienna, just to the right of his analyst's couch. And that is a couch, of course, which you invoke in the exhibition. Though here in the exhibition, it's yes. not Gradiva, but rather the objects of your fixation that hang above the couch. Yes. Now in saying this, um, you know, I'm, I have the suspicion that this, parallel with what happens to you and what happens to the protagonist in Jensen's uh, novel Gradiva, that that parallel is, will not be entirely to your taste because, um, and one might say you have this in common with Michel Foucault, for you, uh, I suspect that Freudian psychoanalysis seems more to be part of the whole psychiatric disciplinary uh, machinery, a machinery that subjugates women in particular, a machinery that turns on the violence of the norm. Um, and I note that I don't think it's in the exhibition, but one of your photographed masks that you hold up mm -hmm. um, is of Freud. Um, so I wonder, given your involvement with psychoanalysis and yet the sense that this relationship is fraught, I wonder if you could say a little about that relationship. So um, this is not from the exhibition. This is a movie I did, a film I did uh, with the mask. Uh, it's not part of the address project, but here it's called uh, Father Not Uncle, this film. And this film is uh, saying something Freud uh, wrote a case study where he spoke about uh, a girl that uh, asked him to help her on the Alpine uh, mountains when he went to a vacation. And he did an analysis uh, with her, yes, this is Katarina, on the mountain. 
he wrote in the coffee there or something in the hotel that he's a doctor. She was 16 and she went up to the hill. And he heard while he was uh, mediating with a beautiful view and think, oh my God, I don't see any now I have a week of vacation. He heard a voice who was asking him, are you a doctor, sir? And she told him her story. But there is a note he wrote 20 years later that the arrestor was her father, but he wrote that the arrestor was her uncle. He didn't want to write it's the father. So what I did in this film, I'm playing the role of Freud and of the role of Katerina. And he, I don't think he would like so much the, the film of what I did with him. And when Freud with his mask is in the um, uh, project with the dress, it's beautiful to see him with the mask, but with a dress. Mm. So I have to say, I, I belong to a psychoanalytic institute. They took me as, you know, kind of outsider, uh, but, uh, but they also wants to have some people which are artists and writers. Um, but Freud is not at all um, something that I will, uh, I think he, he, he have done some, but I think I'm more connected in my work to other uh, psychoanalysts. I think, uh, I don't know how much, how long the psychoanalysis will still exist because I think there is a big gap going on. But the sofa there in my exhibitions has a, has a role because there are many secrets uh, in, in my work and spaces. And when I have a sofa is because every time I go to the museum, there's just one thing I want to do is to lie on a couch and there's never couches in the museums. <laughs> all I want is to sleep. So I have in all my spaces, I have a couch that first and analysis couch is good, but there's also secret here on the couch. I can just tell you that when I did analysis, I asked from my therapist for a little bit from the fabric that I used to lie on. And what you see here, I'm telling my secret, is the fabric I was lying on for many, many years. So I installed things that when I'm in the space, they helping me to, and again, I'm saying, to infiltrate to another spaces. This is what you see here is a, a, a it's to transfer myself, you know, it's an object to transfer myself to other spaces. I think if I explain myself good enough. So it's a it's a complex yeah. and <laughs> fraught relationship. It's not a passive relationship. It's no, a no, challenging no. relationship to psychoanalysis, to the whole psychiatric apparatus, the whole discipline of psychiatry. And that, of course, takes us back to the earlier works, mm -hmm. the Michael Hyman tests, uh, uh, three of which are in the exhibition. Um, yes. And these again depart from your encounter with a historical prototype, a prototype that then prompts your reactive um, work um, yes. and the retort that that work offers. So I wonder if you could describe that point of departure of these yes. extraordinary um, uh, tests and, uh, and describe how, how that encounter with the historical prototype led to these uh, complicated works. <laughs> they are complicated. Okay, so I was an artist. I, I, I was painting. I did. The, I had my my big archive. I started to, and then I didn't feel good. So not feeling good, I went to a psychologist, but just to have um, a, a short conversation. But instead of a conversation, she took out boxes with images. First, she asked me, me, the painter, to paint a tree, and then a man, and then a woman. So I was, wow. And then she asked me to tell stories about images from the rocks. And that was fantastic because the images were, I mean, look at this image. Like, whatever you do, you're in trouble. If you say they are nice to each other, if you say she's a monster, 
if whatever you do, you're on this cycle of psychology that you never... So I was feeling all these feelings and I tried to get this thematic perception test. No psychologist wanted to give it to me because it's a secret test. So I couldn't get it. One said it's in here, one said I forgot, one said... <laughs> They're so afraid, you know, it's like if you take a work of art of Van Gogh and you show it again and again, that, that will kill the ability to give different, uh... <laughs> it's ridiculous. But anyway, I went there twice. She showed me about 20 images. And I, when I went out, I said, okay, this hasn't, was never done in spaces for art asking people to read images in front of someone. And that's brought me to start the Michal Ayman test. So these, um, these Michal Hyman tests, are, I mean, in the exhibition, mm -hmm. they're these beautifully made boxes with all of the mm -hmm. components, they're, they're shown in vitrines, yes. which does have the, you know, usefulness that it emphasizes this strangely dislocated archival character. But of mm -hmm. course, these tests are not meant to be objects. No. They are meant to be used, mm -hmm. as indeed were the disciplinary prototypes. And yes. um, Claire's inclusion of videos on the mezzanine floor uh, mm -hmm. acknowledges this, gives us some access to this. But I I, I'd like to hear you say more um, about how these tests work, not as beautiful objects, but in practice. Um, hear a little more about your experience of actually using them to yes. interrogate and interact with um, actual live subjects, people. Yes. So perhaps so, you could say a little bit more about that so we yes. can get these boxes out of the vitrines uh, and set them to work. So first, I want to uh, remind you that our contact um, and my luck were these boxes because you saw them as objects and you fell in love with them, right? They were not like, I didn't activate them when you... So as an object, they also play a role. Yeah. Because what I did is, as you can see, the TAT before, the box before, I asked the designer, it's Michael Gordon, he did with me all the boxes, is exactly along the lines of the thematic perception test. So there was an idea here that I'm going to replace the plates in the thematic perception test that were, uh, uh, that were drawings to photographs because photographs are objectors. Photographs, of, uh, 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 they, they don't let you really read them. I wrote a lot about it. Um, you can do with them whatever you want, like with uh, paintings. So here you can see a girl and already when she's seven, is not even in Israel, she's looking at the map of Israel before she arrived to Israel with her teacher. But for me, there is also something very erotic between them. So in my images from archives, uh, also my, my family archive and other archives has inside them the same, the, the, the psychologists, they show you ambivalent images. And my books also have ambivalent op option for reading, but with photographs. And also they have a manual. I have a manual. It was written by Ariela Uzulai. I asked her to write a manual for the, for the test. It was 30 years ago, a long time ago. And first time I uh, exhibited it in, uh, with Katrin David in Documenta, 1997 uh, in Kassel in Germany. Everyone was on the walls. I had a small table, two chairs, and you're invited to Michal Ayman test. The, the creator, she couldn't believe that's all what you want from the whole Documenta. I said, yeah, I want a table and I want two chairs. And I've sent six young curators. This is Adas. I trained them six months with psychologists of what you do in a test. And they said, what if no one is going to arrive? Because it's so, I said, it won't be probably the ugliest work in Documenta. But if no one is going to arrive, 
then okay, this is the work. For three months, thousand people came in and I have recorded all of them with different languages, reading images of photography. I believe if, if I wasn't an Israeli artist because all the creators from Israel, they saw my work, they ran away. <laughs> And, you know, if I was from another place, which may be uh, more proud of its artists, now it's different, but there was 30 years ago, it would be the first work with a sharing reading of photographs. And this was my first test. So once again, just as we noticed a moment ago with Radical Link and with the Dress Project, the the function and uh, meaning of your work resides in performance. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, perhaps that's something that's even more evident in earlier work that's not in the exhibition, such as a tale of art that attacks linking, an actual uh, performance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder if you could talk a little about that dimension of performance and what it opens up for you, but also how it complicates your exhibition strategies um, and perhaps even how it leads on to your work in film and video. Okay, thank you for that I can talk about it. Thank you, John. Um, I remember I just started to, to study photography and later I studied video and painting, whatever. I didn't feel good about photography. And I, I was uh, with a partner then, and he was wandering in an, apart in, in an apartment naked. And I was just uh, starting uh, to study uh, photography and I took my camera and he saw a portrait of Van Gogh on the table and he put him it, it on himself, not that I won't, uh, I won't see his nakedness. And then I printed it and I started to talk to him. Why is this photograph my work? You did the actual interesting act. I just took it. So it's a joint uh, act together. And what I did, and I, I, I'm, it's thanks to you that the last few days I was thinking of uh, of our conversation and I went back to this image. I didn't even have time to, to find it. It was maybe one of the first 10 photographs I've ever done and I didn't do much with my camera. I mean, it's not. So I took, it was my first stamp. I have many stamps and I asked for a stamp which was written on it performance. And I took the photograph, I stamped on him performance and then it became again something which I was more controlling, which was me taking the photo, him doing the act, and I'm calling it, naming it, performance. So I, I'm really, I'm, I'm happy to say it. I'm quite, um, because I didn't think about it. Just a few days ago, this is a matter of fact, one of my first photographs were already performance. Mm. So I think that, for example, pain. Pain is traveling. I don't know about you, but my pain is never about anything in specific part of my body. It's all the time traveling. <laughs> I think Freud and his other uh, companions didn't understand that. That pain has got nothing to do that you cut my hand now because it's painful. It's nothing to do with that. So I think I'm always, I'm never here, never there. I'm always trying to infiltrate in other places, uh, restless and performance and video and sound and smells. They let me uh, act. It, it came to my mind as you were speaking that this is not so far from Ariella Azulay's um, notion of the photographic event, the photograph as a collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, as just as you described that photograph that you made, but that in this profound sense you didn't make, uh, rather close to her later conception of the photographic event. But yeah, I will say that I think that the first time Ariella was asked to read a, a photograph was that I asked her. Mm. 
Maybe she wouldn't like this, but I think she's my best student. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, I've got half a mind on our clock uh, as well. So I'd like to come back to um, the central themes and engagements of your work, in which it's clear that the workings of the insane asylum, the practices of psychiatric normalization, the policing of identity, the institutional structures of objectification, separation, um, the imposition of supposedly unbreachable borders and barriers. All of these uh, take us back squarely to questions of power and questions of politics, and thence to the problem of the order of the modern state, an order that is put under challenge in your work by the fluidity that you open up, a fluidity that crosses spatial and temporal boundaries, as we've seen in this project, uh, a fluidity that crosses lines of separation that impose identities. So it Clearly, there's a political engagement here, a feminist politics, certainly, but not only that. It seems to me a politics that speaks of your relation to the territoriality of the state in general, but also more particularly to your position as an artist in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what, what, what that means to you. And how does it drive your uh, cultural politics of infiltration and overturning? Yes. First of all, I don't know if you, thank you. First of all, I'm so happy that you asked me that question and give me a platform for a dialogue. First to understand my opinion and also to listen to an Israeli uh, female artist. It's not, an, it's not an easy position at all. I'm, of course, against any violence, and I believe uh, that we have to give bigger place as possible to Palestinian artists. And as you already understood, the right of return is, was a main, the main thing uh, in my work, and it's because in my area, in where I live, I think this is the biggest question. I wasn't conscious about it for many years, but I'm conscious about it much more because you know we have so much more knowledge of what happened. And I would like to answer you because we agree on so many, I'm sure, on so many levels of uh, you know, we have to stop this occupatory occupation. And we have, we have, we have, but that's there are more people to, to say it better than me. But I want to go to another place and maybe more rare. When I was a child, I think I was 11, I had my best year teacher was Namaz Ibram. And he gave us to read a story, I think it was O. Henry's story, I'm not sure, about the occupation of Britain on India. And his idea was, that if you occupied someone, you become corrupted. And that's, I think, what is happening in Israel. And that, I think, is the fate of everyone who will occupy other people. And I will give you an example of why I'm saying it and why I also established, uh, 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 founded an organization for women, because Palestinian women, uh, Jewish women, uh, whatever, foreigner here, and I have many of them in my uh, project. There is many layers in my project of the dress. Many of, uh, of, uh, of, of all, all these women suffering a lot. And I think that if all of this will continue, and I'll give you numbers, one of six Israeli girls, women, uh, is, uh, was raped or I mean, harasser, there is one of three, but 90% of all this, uh, what's happening is from a person who is close to these women. 
to those women. We're talking about 90%. And I believe this, if Israel will continue the occupation and control our life and the form of apartheid that it is doing, and maybe it's not the form of apartheid of South Africa, but there's many, as a, I mean, I read the lawyer, uh, uh, Michael Sparad, and he said there's many forms of apartheid. It doesn't have to be one. <laughs> so if this continue, there will be not, no, not much chance to children in Israel and, uh, and, uh, and to women. And we Israeli artists and female artists together with, uh, with Badmin, with Muslims, and also, uh, we, we, I mean, there is, a, there is a great community, I think, of art here. We're trying to do things together. And my, uh, an academy of her own organization, it's international. We have women from all over the world. And no boycott here, because we have, we're sharing a lot of uh, suffering and a lot of, um, I mean, not so much different from our uh, community with the 19th century women. <laughs> so this is my part in the world. Um, <clears throat> to say this, that I'm very concerned because if you are uh, worried about occupation, then you have to give money to build to more weapons, to build more roads and not to the people that need it. So not to the arts, not to the women. You know, I, I, I saw yesterday in the in television, a program that there are 200 women now in Israel that waiting for dogs, dogs that were trained because they're afraid to walk outside of their home with their children and, and they don't want to go to shelters. They don't go to go to asylums. Why he's outside there and we have to go with our children to, to shelters. Now women can say no, at least they can have a hearing. But that is my biggest worry, uh, John. Thank you, Michal. I really appreciate your willingness to uh, confront what are very difficult and challenging questions and but that speak to the, the wider implications of your commitment to a right to cross over a right to return um, and indeed I think that's um, also speaks to why um, we've thought it's so important to have your exhibition at Binghamton even if that means um, a difficult relationship with the, the boycott. Um, I think it's been very important for us to, to stage that. And I'm extremely grateful to you for being so open and so generous throughout this whole process with your time, with your willingness to probe the, the investments of your own work. Um, I'm grateful for your generosity, though I see that the clock is being less generous with us. Um, so before we return to any uh, q and I'd like to thank you again, Michal, for this uh, encounter that we've had today. And I want to thank again, Claire Kovacs, because she's been our constant behind the scenes, wizard of ours, making the spheres move. And I also want to thank our audience, our audience um, present now and our audience to come as the recordings of this event circulate. And let me remind everybody too that the exhibition, Michal Hyman, Chronically Linked, remains open um, on Binghamton University campus, remains open until December 10th. So I hope that our conversation, this is what was intended, I hope that our conversation has opened the door, um, opened the door to the exhibition or um, has inspired you to, um, go through that door to visit the exhibition or return again um, if you've already done so. Um, but for now, I'll thank you again, Michal, and hand us over again to Claire. I just want to say one thing first, thank you. But second, don't forget, John, you British, right? Indeed. So we might be relatives as I was in this asylum in 1855. So. <laughs> No boycott is possible about concern to me. 
<laughs> well, I suddenly realized as we look back at, uh, as I as search Google Maps for Springfield Park, that it was indeed in Tooting, um, where yeah. in a former life, I also walked the streets of Tooting. Don't know how much I googled on uh, on the, from far away on uh, on the, on this asylum, and also I did something you don't know, but Israel they have in Gaza they build things like if it's Gaza, you know, a whole town. So I'm building my exhibition partly not in Binghamton because I wasn't there, but building it as asylums. So a lot of. Uh, Thank you both so much for such a, a wonderful conversation. And I know some folks have just joined us um, and I apologize for the, the confusion about, about time zones. For those of you that did just join us, there will be a recording of this. And so you can catch up. I, that will be available via the Binghamton University Art Museum's YouTube website. It'll, we'll put it out on our social media. And I also believe you will get a link to the recording um, since you signed up for this. But we have, um, I will just take a little bit more time here. Um, we have the opportunity, if there's anyone in the audience that wants to ask a question, I either ask you to raise your hand as, a, as the icon or pop it into the chat saying that you would like to ask a question. I will, um, I'll moderate them and take them as they come. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Zoom again, if you if you look at the toolbar, there's a um, a chat icon as well as if you hit and if you don't see that, you can hit the three dots for more, and you'll be able to see some more um, options there. So, does anyone have any questions for Michal or John and or John? Maybe maybe we can take all the images so we can see each other. Yeah, that works. I was just uh, yes, there we go. Okay. Oh. So, okay. Uh, so, I see uh, your hand go ahead and unmute uh, Hi, good evening. Thank you, Michal. Thank you, John. Oh, I lost something. Where I am? Just a second. I don't know what I did, but I see only myself and I don't like it. Oh? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. If you go up to the top corner. <laughs> okay, uh, I found it. <laughs> you found it. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. You can ask your question again. <laughs> Apologies. Hi, thank you so much for organizing this um, and for Michal and John for this conversation. I have a question for Michal, but maybe uh, John, you can uh, say your opinion about, about this too. I was really intrigued about the way John described that um, the way in which uh, hearing the project started and 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 Michal, you, you elaborated further about how you saw yourself in the picture, but soon thereafter, it was not, on, not anymore about yourself, about reconnecting to that past self, but to everyone in the asylum. So there was a personal connection to that photograph, but it seems to me that very quickly it became something more of, of an act of, of someone who is looking to liberate everyone because, because it didn't stay about yourself. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, about this connection between the, the personal and, and, and the switch to it becoming something more social or more global or more about, about not only yourself. John, you want to answer? Um, You know what struck me in this work? Um, I, I actually wrote about Dr. Diamond um, way back in 1979, um, where my concern was to say, oh, we can't just appropriate these um, haunting pictures as uh, lost 19th century portraits and restore them to the history of photography to insist that they belong in another archive and that that archive is um, coercive and disciplinary um, and certain. So my notion of challenging the way those photographs work would be to bring out the politics of the disciplinary apparatus. What's striking about Michal is that she sidesteps that and says, well, we undo that structure, that institutional structure, that machinery of objectification and subjection we undo it by identification and love, which is a very different 
st uh, strategy, but that I want to bring out that it is equally as committed as my 1979 um, wanting to talk about power and photography and machineries of surveillance, that it is um, equally a, a, a political act uh, and a poignant one um, as well. Is that right, Michal? Or? Yes, I was reading it now. You sent me. Uh, oh, I yes. Have some, yeah. I had some other books by you, and I was like, how possible we didn't meet like before but it's so interesting that you you i i, I already i i printed it and i signed i'm going to send you some some things we didn't arrive to them today but first of all thank you for saying the word love because you know some people think i'm busy with attacking <laughs> attacks on linking but the understanding and i know Eleanor, and she wrote a beauty i wish we have more time to hear what you're thinking about my work at taxon linking she wrote a wonderful uh, piece about that but the idea of the taxon linking uh, which beyond and the the british psychoanalyst uh, coined is only when you attack linking a link and understand it you can build a new one <laughs> This is part of, I mean, part of, maybe it's, it's, yeah, you have to use many, many things to do it. But then when you untie it, when you attack it, because Bion is asking, as a matter of fact, starting, Bion is asking, why sometimes the baby is attacking his mother? He's dependent on her. Why is he attacking her? Why is he attacking the link? Because, and I, I know, I, I think I know, because she doesn't see something, isn't it? <laughs> And I'm so busy about what people don't see or what they're afraid to see or they're afraid to look at. And in my past, and I don't want too much to talk about it, but I was forced, when I was 15 and a half, I was forced to see something I was not supposed to. And in my mind, it turned into a photograph. Mm. But I think that since then, since this is an, an it, it's a traumatic, uh, Thing what I saw, but I think since then, and what is amazing that in the place I saw it, there were all my family uh, albums. <laughs> so I started to dig in them. So it's a whole story about that. But I think from attacking a link, they could come very, very beautiful other links with a lot of love and with a lot of uh, new connections. And although it's, as I said, it's a risk and I'm trying to learn how to do it. But um, this is what I'm trying to do. Thank you both so much. And thank you Eleanor, for the, the question. Um, we have time maybe for one or two more questions depending on how long folks wanna stick around. Um, so if anybody wants to raise their hand um, or drop in the chat that they would like to ask a question, I'm happy to give you space. I know it's like class, Claire. Maybe I would like to ask you, Claire. Yes. Um, we had three years together, right? Because I was supposed to show my work in 2020 and then the epidemic came. And this is partly, uh, John, why we didn't activate the test. Because when we were supposed to activate the test, Claire said, we can't sit to each uh, next to each other two meters. We can't have headphones. <laughs> we can't talk. We need a mask. Nothing, I mean, nothing could happen with the tests. So we decided to use them as an object, uh, which is from one end, it's a pity. From the other end, I wish to work more with you and Claire, so we'll have to activate them somewhere else or there. <laughs> I hope it's just a start. And I really, I wonder, and that's in order to give you a compliment, if I was there, the, the exhibition will, will not look like that, you know? <laughs> no, I would make it an asylum. I would complicate it. Oh, my God. But you've done such a wonderful work. I mean, the distance between the works, I would never think about that. The films, you, uh, you, you also, you, we didn't talk about my, my movies today. 
and they had all of them is about uh, you can say it's about relationship we could say about lying women we can say about love but in all of them there is something that i want to move from one space one time to another <laughs> all of them but we didn't even talk about it and you agreed to show them together and you found such a beautiful way so i want to hear you a little bit to talk a little bit about the the thinking process no thank uh, you so yeah, much um yeah. for yeah. the the opportunity to talk about that i mean it is you know as as you mentioned this has been a meandering road for the two of us we've we've spent quite a bit of digital time together we've held space for each other we've you know jumped over hurdles together and so it's it's given me time to get to know different aspects of your work and also for me, get to know the space a little better because when we first started having these conversations, I was still somewhat new in the position. And so when we came to the point that it was time to actually conceive of the exhibition layout, I had a, a bit more, a, a couple of more exhibitions under my belt, so to speak. And so I was really thinking about how do I create space in the galleries um, for different types of experiences for the viewers. And so I wanted to center the dress project in the main gallery because from the very beginning, I was thinking about our big wall and the way that we could either put the series of the large photographs on there or the um, the smaller images, which is what we ended up doing with the grid. Um, I really wanted to have a space where these works interacted with each other across a, a you know a three-dimensional spatial relationship and then I really wanted to think about the mezzanine space as a place that was maybe a little bit more of an intimate viewing experience um, that is where all of our uh, our videos are as you as you mentioned they're either on headphones or they are or I should say you you they're either on monitors excuse me um and all of them have headphones they all have sound components and then in the very back of the gallery in a small space, there's there's four videos that are projected on the wall. Uh, there's also the trains up there. And I think that all of it is important. Um, the experience up there is much more intimate and one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And so that was sort of how I was thinking about the, the layout of the space. And you know, with any curatorial project, it, it's partly limited by very practical concerns, but then also really living into your work and thinking about it. Um, Thank you. Thank you. By the way, I want to take that's it's very beautiful and, and you feel it. People just praising about it just for photographs. I hope that till December I'll be able to come and see it, but uh, I don't know yet. Uh, I want to thank, and I think uh, John will agree with me, Nama Koreman is here and also Dr. Verd Maimon, both doctors, that they thought that uh, I should uh, meet you. <laughs> and everything else is. Uh, what happened? So thank you, Nama. And also to very Maimon. Yeah, well, thank you. And I think on, on that note, this is a, a great way for us to wrap up. Again, for those of us that just those of you that just joined us, I apologize for the confusion in terms of time zones, but we have been recording this. This will be available on the museum YouTube page. You'll also get a follow-up email with a, a, a just a, a rough download that you can you can download, but uh, keep an eye out for that. I hope that you can join us for our next Zoom conversation with Mikhail and Elizabeth, um, which is happening in November. And um, thank you all for joining us today and have a wonderful Thank you, Elizabeth, as well. And see you yeah. soon. Thank you so yeah. much, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, John and Claire. And thank you, Diana. I think he's here. Just